At the Cedars by Duncan Campbell Scott. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. You had two girls, Baptiste. One is Virginie. Hold hard, Baptiste. Listen to me. The whole drive was jammed in that bend at the Cedars. The rapids were dammed, the logs tight rammed and crammed. You might know the devil had clinched them below. We worked three days. Not a budge. She's as tight as a wedge on the ledge, says our foreman. Mon Dieu! Boys, look here. We must get this thing clear. He cursed at the men, and we went for it then. With our cant dogs a row, we just gave he yo ho when she gave a big shove from above. The gang yelled and tore for the shore. The logs gave a grind like a wolf's jaws behind and as quick as a flash with a shove and a crash they were down in a mash but i and ten more all but isaac dufour were ashore he leaped on a log in the front of the rush and shot out from the bind while the jam roared behind as he floated along he balanced his pole and tossed us a song but just as we cheered up darted a log from the bottom leaped thirty feet fair and square and came down on his own he went up like a block with a shock and when he was there in the air kissed his hand to the land when he dropped my heart stopped for the first logs had caught him and crushed him when he rose in his place there was blood on his face there were some girls, Baptiste, picking berries on the hillside, where the river curls, Baptiste, you know. On the still side, one was down by the water. She saw Isaiah fall back. She did not scream, Baptiste. She launched her canoe. It did seem, Baptiste, that she wanted to die too. For before you could think, the birch cracked like a shell in that rush of hell and i saw them both sink baptiste he had two girls one is virginie what god calls the other is not known to me end of poem this recording is in the public domain at the top of the world by lca gidlow Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist Come to me at the top of the world, O oh mine, Before the years spill all our love into time's cup, And give our will to time's will. My wide basin is full of starlight, My moon is lighted with new fire, I have lit every sun in the firmament with the hurting flame of my desire. The worms there in the valley die to forget death, but here at the top of the world I laugh under my breath. There is pain here, beloved, and tears, terrible tears, but the joys have warm mouths and the madnesses dance downward with the years come to me at the top of the world o oh mine the valley is deep the valley is over full with the dying and with those that sleep but here wonderful winds blow and the pines sing one song come to me at the top of the world come quickly i have waited too long End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Canada by Sir Charles George Douglas Roberts Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter O child of nations, giant-limbed, Who standst among the nations now, Unheeded, unadored, unhymned, with unanointed brow how long the ignoble sloth 
how long the trust in greatness not thine own surely the lion's brood is strong to front the world alone how long the indolence ere thou dare achieve thy destiny seize thy fame ere our proud eyes behold thee bear a nation's franchise nation's name the saxon force the celtic fire these are thy manhood's heritage why rest with babes and slaves seek higher the place of race and age i see to every wind unfurled the flag that bears the maple wreath thy swift keels furrow round the world its blood-red folds beneath thy swift keels cleave the furthest seas thy white sails swell with alien gales to stream on each remotest breeze the black smoke of thy pipes exhales o falterer let thy past convince thy future all the growth the gain the fame since cartier knew thee since thy shores beheld champlain montcalm and wolf wolf and montcalm quebec thy storied citadel a test and burning song in psalm how here thy heroes fell o thou that borest the battle's brunt at queenston and at lundy's lane on whose scant ranks but iron front the battle broke in vain whose was the danger whose the day from whose triumphant throats the cheers at chrysler's farm at chateauguay storming like clarion bursts our ears on soft pacific slopes beside strange floods that northward rave and fall where chafes acadia's chainless tide thy sons await thy call they wait but some in exile some with strangers housed in stranger lands and some canadian lips are dumb beneath egyptian sands o mystic nile thy secret yields before us thy most ancient dreams are mixed with far canadian fields and murmur of canadian streams but thou my country dream not thou wake and behold how night is done how on thy breast and o'er thy brow bursts the uprising sun end of poem this recording is in the public domain come and lie with me by lca gidlow read for librivox.org by newgate novelist come and lie with me and love me bitterness touch me with your hands a little kiss me as you lean above me with your cold sadistic kisses wind your hair close close around me pain might dissipate this blankness hurt me even even wound me i have need of love that stings come and lie with me and love me bitterness so that i can laugh at things end of poem this recording is in the public domain Day That I Have Loved by Rupert Brooke Read for LibriVox.org by Recording Person Day That I Have Loved Tenderly, day that I have loved, I close your eyes And smooth your quiet brow And fold your thin, dead hands The grey veils of the half-light deepen Coloured eyes I bear you, a light burden To the shrouded sands where lies your waiting boat by wreaths of the seas making mist garlanded with all grey weeds of the water crowned there you'll be laid past fear of sleep or hope of waking and over the unmoving sea without a sound faint hands will row you outward out beyond our sight us with stretched arms and empty eyes on the far gleaming and marble sand 
beyond the shifting cold twilight further than laughter goes or tears further than dreaming there'll be no port no dawnlit islands but the drear waste darkening and at length flame ultimate on the deep oh the last fire and you unkissed unfriended there oh the lone way's red ending and we not there to weep we found you pale and quiet and strangely crowned with flowers lovely and secret as a child you came with us came happily hand in hand with the young dancing hours high on the downs at dawn void now and tenebrous the grey sands curve before me from the inland meadows fragrance of june and clover floats the dark and fills the hollow sea's dead face with little creeping shadows and the white silence brims the hollow of the hills close in the nest is folded every weary wing hushed all the joyful voices and we who held you dear eastward we turn and homeward alone remembering day that i loved day that i loved the night is here end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Dewdrop by Samuel Lover Read for LibriVox.org by Melanie T Part 1 A dewdrop once, in a summer's night, Was touched by the wand of a faithless sprite. As the moon in her change shot a trembling ray Down the bosky dell where the dewdrop lay, And tainted with change by the wild wood sprite, Was the dewdrop till then so pure and so bright for what might be pure if twere not the dew a gift from the skies earth sweets to renew and what may be bright as the dewdrops are kindred are they to the evening star blessed is the dew when the day's begun it flies to the kiss of the godlike sun blessed is the dew at the evening hour taking its rest in some grateful flower that gives forth its odour to welcome the fall of the dewdrop that sinks in the balmy thrall enfolded in fragrance entranced it lies till the morning's dawn when it lightly flies from the balmy lips of the waking flower which droops through the day when the dew drops away and mourns the delay of the evening hour oh how the sprite struck dewdrop strayed mong the wildest flowers of the wildwood glade toying with all she was constant to none though she held her faith to the lordly sun she sought a new couch as the eve grew dim but at morning she ever returned to him the fond rose pined in its hidden heart while the dewdrop played her changeful part and though it was kissed by some dewdrop bright, grieve that it was not the one of last night. The leaf sheltered lily, pale flower of the vale, the love plaint felt of the nightingale, whose song never bore so much meanings now. O oh, sympathy subtle in teaching art thou, the violet heart like, the sweeter for grief sighed forth its balm in its own relief while its jealous companions conceived it blessed and envied the pang of an aching breast thus eve after eve did the dewdrop betray some leaflet that smiled on the pendant spray and blossoms that sprang from a healthful root faded in grief and produced no fruit but what cared she who was always caressed as she sank in delight on some fresh flower's breast though it died the next night she could pass it and say poor thing twas my love of yesterday at last in her pride so faithless got she even forsook the forget-me-not and nature frowned on the bright coquette and sternly said i will teach thee yet a lesson so hard thou wilt not forget part two the roses of summer 
are past and gone and sweet things are dying one by one but autumn is bringing in richer suits to match with his sunsets his glowing fruits and the flowers the dewdrop deserted now for the richer caress of the clustering bough so dainty a dewdrop a leaf would not suit for her nothing less would suffice than the fruit the bloom of the plum and the nectarine's perfume were deserted in turn a fresh love to assume and as each she gave up if her conscience did preach her ready excuse was the down of the peach but fruits will be gathered ere autumn shall close then where in her pride may the dewdrop repose nor a bud nor a flower nor a leaf is there now they are gone whom she slighted there's naught but the bough and the dewdrop would now keep her mansion of air with her bright lord the sun nor at evening repair to the desolate earth where no lovers remain but grasses so humble and brambles so plain so crooked so knotty so jagged and bare indeed would the dew keep her mansion of air but nature looked dark and her mandate gave and the autumn dew was her winter slave when the lordly sun had his journey sped far in the south towards ocean's bed and short was the time that he held the sky his oriflamme waving nor long nor high and the dewdrop lay in the dark cold hours embraced by the weeds that survived the flowers oh chill was her tear as she thought of the night she had wept in pure joy at her rose's delight while now for the morning she sighed that its ray should bear her from lonesome embraces away like a laggard it came and so briefly it shone she'd scarce reached the sky ere her bright lord was gone and downward again among weeds was she born to linger in pain till her bright lord's return and nature frowned on the bright coquette and again she said i will teach thee yet a lesson so hard thou wilt never forget part three through the bare branches sighed the chill breeze as the sun went down where the leafless trees are darkly standing like skeletons grim gainst the fading light of the west grown dim and colder and colder the embers decay that were glowing red with the fire of day till darkness wrapped in her mantle drear the withering forms of the dying year thus bleak and black was the face of the world when winter his silvery banner unfurled his sprites sending forth in their glittering array to seize in the night each fantastical spray and the fern in the wood and the rush by the stream were sparkling with gems in the morning beam so charmed was the stream with the beauty around that it stopped in its course and it uttered no sound in the silent entrancement of winter's embrace it sought not to wander from that charmed place for better it loved with old winter to be in the diamond-hung woods than be lost in the sea but the dewdrop's home was in yon bright sky and when in the sunbeam she sought to fly chained to a weed was the bright frail thing and she might not mount on her morning wing ha ha laughed nature i've caught thee now bride of old winter bright thing art thou think of how many a flower for thee hath wasted its heart in despondency now where thou art fettered thou must remain let thy pride rejoice in so bright a chain true said the dewdrop in all thou'st told my fetters are bright but ah so cold rather than sparkle in diamond chain i'd dwell with the humblest flower again and never would rove from a constant bliss 
if I might scape from a fate like this, in glittering misery, bid me not sleep, mother, oh let me melt and weep, weep in the breast of my chosen flower, and for ever renounce my changeful hour, for though to the skies I shall daily spring, at the sunrise bright on my rainbow wing, to my flower I'll return at golden heaven, with a love refreshed at the font of heaven. The spirit of spring was listening near, the captive dewdrop she came to cheer. Her fetter she broke, and the chosen flower was given to the dewdrop in happy hour. And true to her faith did the dewdrop come, when the honey bee, with his evening hum, was bidding farewell to the rose which he taught by his fondness to know, twas with sweetness fraught. And the rose thought the bee was a silly thing to fly from the dew with his heavy wing. For ah, sighed the rose as it hung on the bough, bright dewdrop, there's nothing so sweet as thou. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. For Annie by Edgar Allan Poe. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. For Annie. Thank heaven the crisis, the danger is past, and the lingering illness is over at last, and the fever called living is conquered at last. Sadly, I know I am shorn of my strength. No muscle I move as I lie at full length. But no matter, I feel I am better at length. And I rest so composedly now in my bed that any beholder might fancy me dead, might start at beholding me, thinking me dead. The moaning and groaning, the sighing and sobbing are quieted now with that horrible throbbing at heart. Ah, that horrible, horrible throbbing. The sickness, the nausea, the pitiless pain have ceased with a fever that maddened my brain, with a fever called living that burned in my brain. And, oh, of all tortures, that torture the worst has abated the terrible torture of thirst. For the naphthalene river of passion accursed, I have drunk of a water that quenches all thirst, of a water that flows with a lullaby sound, from a spring but a very few feet underground, from a cavern not very far down underground. And ah, let it never be foolishly said that my room, it is gloomy and narrow, my bed, for man never slept in a different bed, and to sleep you must slumber in just such a bed. My tantalized spirit here blandly reposes, forgetting or never regretting its roses, its old agitations of myrtles and roses. For now, while so quietly lying, it fancies a holier odor about it of pansies, a rosemary odor commingled with pansies, with rue and the beautiful Puritan pansies. And so it lies happily, bathing in many a dream of the truth and the beauty of Annie, drowned in a bath of the tresses of Annie. She tenderly kissed me, she fondly caressed, and then I fell gently to sleep on her breast, deeply to sleep from the heaven of her breast. When the light was extinguished, she covered me warm, and she prayed to the angels to keep me from harm, to the queen of the angels to shield me from harm. Now, in my bed, knowing her love, that you fancy me dead, and I rest so contentedly now in my bed, with her love at my breast, that you fancy me dead, that you shudder to look at me, thinking me dead. But my heart, it is brighter than all of the many stars in the sky, for it sparkles with Annie, it glows with the light of the love of my Annie, with the thought of the light of the eyes of my Annie. End a poem. This recording is in the public domain.
a hint to a young person for his better improvement by reading or conversation by john byram read for LibriVox.org by sonia a hint to a young person for his better improvement by reading or conversation in reading authors when you find bright passages that strike the mind and which perhaps you may have reason to think on at another season be not contented with the sight but take them down in black and white such a respect is wisely shown as makes another sense one's own when you asleep upon your bed a thought may come into your head which may be useful if tis taken due notice of when you are waken of midnight thoughts to take no heed betrays a sleepy soul indeed it is but dreaming in the day to throw our nightly hours away in conversation when you meet with persons cheerful and discreet that speak or quote in prose or rhyme facetious things or things sublime observe what passes and anon when you get home think thereupon write what occurs forget it not a good thing saved is so much got let no remarkable event pass with a gaping wonderment a fool's device lord who would think rather record with pen and ink whatever deserves attention now for when tis gone you know not how too late you'll find that to your cost so much of human life is lost were it not for the written letter pray what were living men the better for all the labours of the dead for all that socrates ever said the morals brought from heaven to man he would have carried back again tis owing to his shorthand youth that socrates does now speak truth end of poem this recording is in the public domain i count my time by times that i meet thee by richard watson gilder read for LibriVox.org by ian king i count my time by times that i meet thee these are my yesterdays my morrows noons and nights these my old moons and my new moons slow fly the hours or fast the hours do flee if thou art far from or art near to me if thou art far the bird tunes are no tunes if thou art near the wintry days are junes darkness is light and sorrow cannot be thou art my dream come true and thou my dream the air i breathe the world wherein i dwell my journey's end thou art and thou the way thou art what i would be yet only seem thou art my heaven and thou art my hell thou art my ever-living judgment day end of poem this recording is in the public domain june by archibald lapman read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter long long ago it seems this summer morn that pale brown april passed with pensive tread through the floor woods and from its frost-bound bed woke the arbutus with her silver horn and now may too is fled the flower-crowned month the merry laughing may with rosy feet and fingers dewy wet leaving the woods and all cool gardens gay with tulips and the scented violet gone are the windflower and the adder tongue and the sad drooping bellwort and no more the snowy trilliums crowd the forest's floor the purpling grasses are no longer young and summer's wide-set door o'er the thronged hills and the broad panting earth lets in the torrent of the later bloom haytime and harvest and the aftermirth the slow soft rain the rushing thunder plume all day in garden alleys moist and dim the humid air is burdened with the rose in moss-deep woods the creamy orchid blows 
and now the vesper sparrows pealing him from every orchard close at eve comes flooding rich and silvery the daisies in great meadows swing and shine and with the wind a sound as of the sea roars in the maples and the topmost pine high in the hills the solitary thrush tunes magically his music of fine dreams in briery dells by boulder broken streams and wide and far on nebulous fields aflush the mellow morning gleams the orange cone flowers purple bossed are there the meadows bold-eyed gypsies deep of hue and slender hawkweed tall and softly fair and rosy tops of fleabane veiled with dew so with thronged voices and unhasting flight the fervid hours with long return go by the far-heard hylas piping shrill and high tell the slow moments of the solemn night with unremitting cry lustrous and large out of the gathering drouth the planets gleam the baleful scorpion trails his dim fires along the drowsed south the silent world encrusted round moves on and all the dim night long the moon's white beams nestle deep down in every brooding tree and sleeping birds touched with a silly glee waken at midnight from their blissful dreams and carol brokenly dim surging motions and uneasy dreads scare the light slumber from men's busy eyes and parted lovers on their restless beds toss and yearn out and cannot sleep for sighs oft have i striven sweet month to figure thee as dreamers of old time were wont to feign in living form of flesh and striven in vain Yet when some sudden old-world mystery of passion fired my brain, thy shape hath flashed upon me like no dream, wandering with scented curls that heap the breeze, or by the hollow of some reeded stream, sitting waist-deep in white anemones. And even as I glimpsed thee, thou wert gone, a dream for mortal eyes too proudly coy. Yet in thy place for subtle thoughts employ, the golden magic clung, a light that shone and filled me with thy joy before me like a mist that streamed and fell all names and shapes of antique beauty passed in garlanded procession with the swell of flutes between the beechen stems and last i saw the arcadian valley the loved wood althea's stream divine the sighing shore and through the cool green glades Awake once more, Psyche, the white-limbed goddess, still pursued, fleet-footed as of yore, the noonday ringing with her frighted peals, down the bright sward and through the reeds she ran, urged by the mountain echoes at her heels, the hot-blown cheeks and trampling feet of Pan. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Kilmeny by James Hogg. Read for LibriVox.org by Devora Allen. Bonnie Kilmeny get up the glen, but it was not to meet Dunera's men, nor the rosy monk of the isle to see, for Kilmeny was pure as pure could be. It was only to hear the Yorland sing and pull the crest lower down the spring, the scarlet hype and the hindberry, and the nut that hung frae the hazel tree, for Kilmeny was pure as pure could be. But long may her minny look o'er the wall, but long may she seek in the greenwood shaw, long the laird o' Dunera blame, and long, long greet or Kilmeny come hame. When many a day had come and fled, when grief grew calm and hope was dead, when mess for Kilmeny's soul had been sung, when the beadsman had prayed and the dead bell rung, late, late in gloaming when all was still, when the fringe was red on the westland hill, the wood was sear, the moon in the wane, the reek of the cot hung over the plain, like a little wee cloud in the world it lane, when the ingle lowed with an eerie lame, late, late in the gloaming, Kilmeny came hame. Kilmeny, Kilmeny, where have you been? 
Long hae we sought both holt and din, by lynn, by ford, and greenwood tree, yet you were halesome and feared to see. Where got you that jupe o' the lily sheen, that bonny snood o' the birk so green, and these roses the fairest that ever were seen? Kilmeny, Kilmeny, where have you been? Kilmeny looked up with a lovely grace, but no smile was seen on Kilmeny's face. As still was her look, and as still was her eye, as the stillness that lay on the emerent lay, or the mist that sleeps on a waveless sea. For Kilmeny had been, she knew not where, and Kilmeny had seen what she could not declare. Kilmeny had been where the cock never crew, where the rain never fell, and the wind never blew. But it seemed as the harp of the sky had rung, and the airs of heaven played round her tongue, when she spake of the lovely form she had seen, and a land where sin had never been, a land of love and a land of light, without in sun or moon or night, where the river swerred a living stream, and the light a pure celestial beam, the land of vision it would seem, a still and everlasting dream. In yon green wood there is a wake, and in that wake there is a wane, and in that wane there is a make, that neither has flesh, blood, nor bane, and down in yon green wood he walks his lane. In that green wane Kilmeny lay, her bosom heaped with flowerets gay, but the air was soft and the silence deep, and bonny Kilmeny fell sound asleep. She kent no mare, nor opened her eye, till waked by the hymns of a far country. She wakened on a couch of a silk so slim, all striped with the bars of the rainbow's rim, and lovely beings round were rife, who erst had travelled mortal life. And I they smiled and gan to spear, what spirit has brought this mortal here? Long have I journeyed the world wide, a meek and reverend fear replied. Both night and day I have watched the fear, I didn't a thousand years and mare. Yes, I have watched o'er ilk degree, wherever blooms feminity. But sinless virgin, free a stain, in mind and body found a name. Never since the banquet of time found I a virgin in her prime, till late this bonny maiden I saw, as spotless as the morning snow. Full twenty years she has lived as free as the spirits that sojourn in this country. I have brought her away frae the snares of men, that sin or death she may never ken. They clasped her waist and her hands so fair, they kissed her cheek and they kemed her hair, and round came many a bloomin' fair, saying, Bonnie Kilmeny, you're welcome here. Women are freed of the litten scorn, O oh, blessed be the day Kilmeny was born. Now shall the land of the spirits see, now shall it ken what a woman may be. Many a long year in sorrow and pain, many a long year through the world we've gain, commissioned to watch fair womankind, for it's they who nourish the immortal mind. We have watched their steps as the dawning shone, and deep in the green wood walks alone. By lily bower and silken bed, the viewless tears have o'er them shed, have soothed their ardent minds to sleep, or left the couch of love to weep. We have seen, we have seen, but the time must come, and the angels will weep at the day of doom. O oh, would the fairest of mortal kind, I keep the holy truths in mind, that kindred spirits their motions see, who watch their ways with anxious a, and grieve for the guilt of humanity. O oh, sweet to heaven the maiden's prayer, and the sigh that heaves a bosom so fair, and dear to heaven the words of truth, and the praise of virtue for a beauty's mouth, and dear to the viewless forms of air, the minds that kith as the body fair. O oh, bonny Kilmeny, free for stain, if ever you seek the world again, that world of sin, of sorrow and fear, O oh, tell of the joys that are waiting here, and tell of the signs you shall shortly see, of the times that are now, and the times that shall be. They lifted Kilmeny, they led her away, and she walked in the light of a sunless day. The sky was a dome of crystal bright, the fountain of vision and fountain of light. The emerald fields were of dazzle and glow, and the flowers of everlasting blow. Then deep in the stream her body they laid, that her youth and beauty never might fade, and they smiled on heaven when they saw her lie, in the stream of life that wandered by. And she heard a song, she heard it sung, she kenned not where, but so sweetly it rung. It fell on the ear like a dream of the morn. O oh, blessed be the day Kilmeny was born. Now shall the land of the spirits see, now shall it ken what a woman may be. The sun that shines on the world so bright, a borrowed glade for the fountain of light, and the moon that sleeks the sky so dun, like a golden bow or a beamless sun, 
shall wear away and be seen no more, and the angels shall miss them travelling the air. But long, long after, both night and day, when the sun and the world have allied away, when the sinner has gone to his wearsome doom, Kilmeny shall smile in eternal bloom. They bore her away, she wist not how, for she felt not arm nor rest below, but so swift they waned her through the light, twas like the motion of sound or sight, they seemed to split the gales of air, and yet nor gale nor breeze was there. Unnumbered groves below them grew, they came, they passed, and backward flew, like floods of blossoms gliding on, in moment seen, in moment gone. O oh, never veils to mortal view appeared like those o'er which they flew. That land to human spirits given, the lowermost veils of the storied heaven, from thence they can view the world below, and heaven's blue gates with sapphires glow, more glory yet unmeet to know. They bore her far to a mountain green, to see what mortal never had seen, and they seated her high on a purple sward, and bade her heed what she saw and heard, and note the changes the spirits wrought, for now she lived in the land of thought. She looked, and she saw nor sun nor skies, but a crystal dome of a thousand eyes. She looked, and she saw no land aright, but an endless whirl of glory and light. And radiant beings went and came, far swifter than wind or the linked flame. She hid her aim for the dazzling view. She looked again, and the scene was new. She saw a sun on a summer sky, and clouds of amber sailing by. A lovely land beneath her lay, and that land had glens and mountains grey, and that land had valleys and hoary piles, and marled seas and a thousand isles. Its fields were speckled, its forests green, and its lakes were all of the dazzling sheen, like magic mirrors where slumbering lay the sun in the sky and the cloudlet grey, which heaved and trembled and gently swung, on every shore they seemed to be hung, for there they were seen on their downward plain. A thousand times and a thousand again, in winding lake and placid firth, little peaceful heavens in the bosom of earth. Kilmeny sighed and seemed to grieve, for she found her heart to that land did cleave. She saw the corn wave on the vale, she saw the deer run down the dale, she saw the plaid and the broad claymore, and the brows that the badge of freedom bore, and she thought she had seen the land before. She saw a lady sit on a throne. The fairest that ever the sun shone on. A lion licked her hand of milk, and she held him in a leash of silk, and a lifeful maiden stood at her knee, with a silver wand and melting eye, her sovereign shield till love stole in, and poisoned all the fount within. Then a gruff untoward beadsman came, and hunted the lion on his dame, and the guardian maid with the dauntless A, she dropped a tear and left her knee, and she saw till the queen frae the lion fled, till the bonniest flower of the world lay dead. A coffin was set on a distant plain, and she saw the red blood fall like rain. Then Bonnie Kilmeny's heart grew sere, and she turned away and could look no mere. Then the gruff grim carl gurned a mane, and they trampled him down, but he rose again, and he baited the lion to deeds of wear, till he lapped the blood to the kingdom dear. And weaning his head was danger proof, when crowned with rose and clover leaf, he gulled at the carl and chased him away. To feed with the deer on the mountain grey, he gowled at the carl and gaped at heaven, but his mark was set and his earls given. Kilmeny a while her ain withdrew, she looked again and the scene was new. She saw before her fair unfurled, one half of all the glowing world, where oceans rolled and rivers ran, to bound the aims of sinful man. She saw a people fierce and fell, burst frae their bounds like fiends of hell. Their lilies grew and the eagle flew. And she herked on her ravening crew, till the cities and towers were wrapped in a blaze, and the thunder it roared o'er the lands and the seas. The widows they wailed, and the red blood ran, and she threatened an end to the race of man. She never leaned nor stood in awe, till caught by the lion's deadly paw. Oh, then the eagle swinked for life, and brain yelled up a mortal strife. But flew she north or flew she south, she met with the gowl of the lion's mouth. With a mooted wing and waveful mane, the eagle sought her airy again, but laying may she cower in her bloody nest, and laying laying sleek her wounded breast, before she say another flight, to play with the Norland lion's might. But to sing the sights Kilmeny saw, so far surpassing nature's law, the singer's voice would sink away, and the string of his harp would cease to play. 
but she saw till the sorrows of man were by, and all was love and harmony, till the stars of heaven fell calmly away, like flakes of snow on a winter day. Then Kilmeny begged again to see the friends she had left in her own country, to tell of the place where she had been, and the glories that lay in the land unseen, to warn the living maidens fair, the loved of heaven, the spirit's care, that all whose minds unmailed remain shall bloom in beauty when time is gain. With distant music soft and deep, they lulled Kilmeny song to sleep, and when she awakened, she lay her lane, all hept with flowers in the greenwood wane. When seven long years had come and fled, when grief was calm and hope was dead, when scarce was remembered Kilmeny's name, late, late in a gloaming, Kilmeny came hame. And all oh, her beauty was fair to see, but still and steadfast was her ay. Such beauty bard may never declare, for there was no pride nor passion there, and the soft desire of maiden's ain in that mild face could never be seen. Her samar was the lily flower, and her cheek the moss rose in the shower, and her voice like the distant melody that floats along the twilight sea. But she loved to rake the lonely glen, and keep it afar frae the haunts of men, her holy hymns unheard to sing, to suck the flowers and drink the spring. But wherever her peaceful form appeared, the wild beasts of the hill were cheered. The wolf played blithely round the field, the lordly bison lowed and kneeled. The dun deer wooed with manner bland, and cowered beneath her lily hand. And when at even the woodlands rung, when hymns of other worlds she sung, in ecstasy of sweet devotion, oh, then the glen was all in motion. The wild beasts of the forest came, broke from their boats and folds the tame, and goved around, charmed and amazed. Even the dull cattle crooned and gazed, and murmured and looked with anxious pain, for something the mystery to explain. The buzzard came with the throstle cock, the corby left her hoof in the rock, the blackbird along with the eagle flew, the hind came tripping o'er the dew, the wolf and the kid their rake began, and the tod and the lamb and the leveret ran. The hawk and the hern atore them hung, and the merle and the mavis for hoyed their young, and all in a peaceful ring were hurled, it was like an eve in a sinless world. When a month and a day had come and gain, Kilmeny sought the green wood wane, there laid her down on the leaves so green, and Kilmeny on earth was never mere seen. But all oh, the words that fell from her mouth were words of wonder and words of truth. But all oh, the land were in fear and dread, for they kenned now whether she was living or dead. It was not her hem, and she could not remain. She left this world of sorrow and pain, and returned to the land of thought again. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Last Invocation by Walt Whitman Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp at the last, tenderly, from the walls of the powerful fortressed house, from the clasp of the knitted locks, from the keep of the well-closed doors, let me be wafted. Let me glide noiselessly forth, with a key of softness unlock the locks, with a whisper set ope the doors, O soul. Tenderly, be not impatient, Strong as your hold, O mortal flesh, Strong as your hold, O love. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lines by Yone Noguchi Read for LibriVox.org by Nima I love the saintly chant of the winds, touching their odorous fingers to the harp of the angel, spring. I love the undiscording sound of thousands of birds, whose concord of song echoes on the rivulet afar. I muse on the solemn mountain, which waits in sound content for the time when the Lord calls forth. I roam with the wings of high-raised fantasy in the pure universe. Oh, I chant of the garden of Adam and Eve.
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Never Any Fear by Elsie A. Gidlow Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist I shall never have any fear of love, Not of its depth nor its uttermost height, Its exquisite pain and its terrible delight. Never, never shall I have any fear of love. I shall never hesitate to go down Into the fastness of its abyss, nor shrink from the cruelty of its awful kiss. I shall never hesitate to go down. Never shall I dread love's strength, nor any hurt it might give. Tender love is a sick fugitive. I shall never dread love's strength. I shall never draw back from love through fear of its vast pain, but build joy of it and count it gain. I shall never draw back from love. I shall never have any fear of love, nor shrink weakly from its touch. I have loved too terribly and too much ever to have any fear of love. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Now by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org By Winston Tharp Out of your whole life give but a moment, All of your life that has gone before, All to come after it, So you ignore, so you make perfect the present, Condense in a rapture of rage For perfection's endowment, Thought and feeling and soul and sense, Merged in a moment, Which gives me at last you around me for once, you beneath me, above me, me sure that despite of time future, time past, this tick of our lifetimes, one moment, you love me. How long such suspension may linger? Ah, sweet, the moment eternal, just that and no more. When ecstasy's utmost we clutch at the core, while cheeks burn, arms open, eyes shut, and lips meet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode on Melancholy by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug No, no, go not to Lethe, neither twist wolf's bane, tight-rooted, for its poisonous wine, nor suffer thy pale forehead to be kissed by nightshade, the ruby grape of Proserpine. Make not your rosary of yewberries, nor let the beetle, nor the death moth be your mournful psyche, nor the downy owl a partner in your sorrow's mysteries. For shade to shade will come too drowsily, and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. For when the melancholy fit shall fall, Sudden from heaven, like a weeping cloud, That fosters the droop-headed flowers all, And hides the green hill in an April shroud, Then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose, Or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave, Or on the wealth of globed peonies, Or, if thy mistress some rich anger shows, Imprison her soft hand, and let her rave, and feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. She dwells with beauty, beauty that must die, and joy, whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu, and aching pleasure nigh, turning to poison while the bee-mouth sips. Ay, in the very temple of delight, veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine. Though seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine, his soul shall taste the sadness of her might, and be among her cloudy trophies hung. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug My heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, As though of hemlock I had drunk, Or emptied some dull opiate To the drains one minute past, And lethe wards had sunk. Though not through envy of thy happy lot, But being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, In some melodious plot of beech and green, And shadows numberless, Singest of summer in full-throated ease. Oh, for a draught of vintage, That hath been cooled a long age In the deep-delved earth, Tasting of flora and the country green, Dance and Provencal song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker, full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrene, with bearded bubbles winking at the brim, and purple stained mouth, that I might drink, and leave the world unseen, and with thee fade away into the forest dim, fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret here, where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last grey hairs, where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies. Where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards. Already with thee, tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms, and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, but, in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit-tree wild, white hawthorn, and the pastoral eglantine, fast-fading violets, covered up in leaves, and mid-May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves. Darkling I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death, called him soft names in many a mused rhyme, to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird, no hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the selfsame song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth, when, sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn, the same that oft-times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas, in fairy lands forlorn. Forlorn! The very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my sole self. Adieu! The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision, or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Ode by John Keats, read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. Written on the blank page before Beaumont and Fletcher's tragic comedy, The Fair Maid of the Inn. Bards of passion and of mirth, ye have left your souls on earth. Have ye souls in heaven too, double lived in regions new? Yes, and those of heaven commune with the spheres of sun and moon, with the noise of fountains wondrous, and the pile of voices thunderous, with the whisper of heaven's trees, and one another in soft ease, seated on Elysian lawns, browsed by none but Diane's fawns, underneath large bluebells tented, where the daisies are rose-scented, and the rose herself has got perfume, which on earth is not, where the nightingale doth sing not a senseless tranced thing, but divine melodious truth, philosophic numbers smooth, tales and golden histories of heaven and its mysteries. Thus ye live on high, and then, on the earth, ye live again, and the souls ye left behind you teach us, here, the way to find you, where your other souls are joying, never slumbered, never cloying. Here, your earth-born souls still speak to mortals, of their little weak, of their sorrows and delights, of their passions and their spites, of their glory and their shame, what doth strengthen and what maim. Thus ye teach us every day wisdom, though fled far away. Bards of passion and of mirth, ye have left your souls on earth, ye have souls in heaven too, double lived in regions new. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On Concord River by Lillian Whiting Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Only while the lilies blow Shall our boat be drifting low While the flush of sunset light fades into the purple night while the whippoorwills are singing and the twilight breeze is bringing dreams of lands in sunset glow shall our boat be drifting low only while the lilies blow while winds murmur soft and low shall we drift on love together in the golden summer weather dreams of perfumes haunt us yet eglantine and mignonette though our boat is drifting low only while the lilies blow end of poem this recording is in the public domain our language by bjornstern bjornsson 1900 read for LibriVox.org. thou who sailest norse mountain air in denmark songs by the cradle singest who badest in hold the war flames flare and heard in our children's joy gently ringest thou treasure of treasures our mother tongue in pain as in pleasures our home and our tower with god our power we hallow thee whispering secrets that holberg stored thou borest him home to a brighter morning didst serve him with armour and wet his sword for satire's assault and for laughter's warning thou spirit all-knowing our mother tongue the ages foregoing the future now growing the present glowing we hallow thee kierkegaard thou to the deeps didst bring where life's full currents in god he sounded for virgiland wert thou the eagle's wing that lifted him sunward to heights unbounded thou treasure of treasures our mother tongue in pain as in pleasures our home and our tower with god our power we hallow thee radiant warmth of a may-day thou to the spring of our freedom gavest in thy clearness our norse flags i with song and honour afar thou wavest 
thou spirit all-knowing our mother tongue the ages foregoing the future now growing the present glowing we hallow thee o'er the ocean unroll thou thy carpet of flowers a bridge that nigher can bring dear friends to meet even now while faith grows greater and heaven higher thou treasure of treasures our mother tongue in pain as in pleasures our home and our tower with god our power we hallow thee best of friends that i found wert thou thou waitest for me in the eyes of mother and leave me last of them all wilt thou who knewest me better than any other thou spirit all-knowing our mother tongue the ages foregoing the future now growing the present glowing we hallow thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain a persuasion by hart crane read for librivox dot org by matt perard if she waits late at night hearing the wind it is to gather kindnesses no world can offer she has drawn her hands away the wind plays andantes of lost hopes and regrets and yet is kind below the wind waiting for morning the hills lie curved and blunt as now her heart and mind end of poem this recording is in the public domain the poet and his friend by lillian whiting read for librivox dot org by bruce Kachuk. the poet read to me his verses i could not get away i heard this earth's a chilling desert the air was soft as may and though i had my own convictions i could not say him nay for surely he who is a poet should better know than i to him the summer tells her secrets the winds and stars reply to him all paradise is open and he should know not i still all the loveliness of living thrilled me anew the glow of all the sunset's dreamy splendor far in the west burned low and as i watched its changeful glory i wondered did he know End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Slave Auction by Francis Ellen Watkins Harper. Read for LibriVox.org by Chuck Williamson. The sale began. Young girls were there, defenseless in their wretchedness whose stifled sobs of deep despair revealed their anguish and distress and mothers stood with streaming eyes and saw their dearest children sold unheeded rose their bitter cries while tyrants bartered them for gold and woman with her love and truth for these in sable forms may dwell gazed on the husband of her youth with anguish none may paint or tell and men whose sole crime was their hue the impress of their maker's hand and frail and shrinking children too were gathered in that mournful band ye who have laid your love to rest and wept above their lifeless clay know not the anguish of that breast whose loved are rudely torn away ye may not know how desolate are bosoms rudely forced to part and how a dull and heavy weight will press the life drops from the heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain
sometime by lillian whiting read for librivox.org by bruce Gachuk. sometime you'll think of these summer days dreamily drifting through purple haze sometime with a thrill of passionate pain you'll long for their sweetness over again sometime when the moonlight is silvering all and the pansies sleep by the garden wall in the mystic twilight's odorous dusk freighted with clustering rose blooms musk you will watch for a flitting figure there white robed and noiseless with falling hair and gazing deep in the luminous eyes that made for your life its paradise the silence and music and wonderful calm of this magical summer will linger like balm till starting you waken to clasp but air and list to a flitting footfall there sometime you'll listen in silence lone for a girlish voice that was all your own for words that only to you were given telling of love and the sweetness of heaven sometime you'd give all the wise world's praise for one of these vanishing summer days for just one leaf from the swaying bough sometime you'd clasp it oh why not now end of poem this recording is in the public domain a summer shower by george cooper read for librivox.org by sonia a summer shower hush sighed the leaves hurry birds hurry see yonder sheaves all in a flurry come under quick grasshopper cricket whispered the vines down in the thicket hide lisped the grass ladybug spider and here's a place fly sit beside her rest katie did here in my bushes butterfly too how the rain rushes why there's the sun hark the birds singing good-bye dear leaves off we'll be winging b smiled the rose thank you for calling drop in again when the rain's falling end of poem this recording is in the public domain the summit of the amorous mountain by alistair crowley read for LibriVox.org by chuck williamson to love you love is all my happiness to kill you with kisses to devour your whole ripe beauty in the perfect hour that mingles us in one supreme caress to drink the purple of your thighs to press your beating bosom like a living flower to die in your embraces in the shower that dews like death your swooning loveliness to know you love me that your body leaps with the quick passion of your soul to know your fragrant kisses sting my spirit so to be one soul where satan smiles and sleeps ah in the very triumph hour of hell satan himself remembers whence he fell end of poem this recording is in the public domain sympathy by dorothy l sayers read for LibriVox.org by matt Perard i sat and talked with you in the shifting fire and gloom making you answer due in delicate speech and smooth nor did i fail to note the black curve of your head 
and the golden skin of your throat on the cushions golden red but all the while behind in the workshop of my mind the weird weaver of doom was walking to and fro drawing thread upon thread with resolute finger slow of the things you did not say and thought i did not know of the things you said to-day and had said long ago to weave on a wondrous loom in dim colours enough a curious stubborn stuff the web that we call truth end of poem this recording is in the public domain to death by carolyn bowles southey read for LibriVox.org by nemo come not in terrors clad to claim an unresisting prey come like an evening shadow death so stealthily so silently and shut mine eyes and steal my breath then willingly oh willingly with thee i'll go away what need to clutch with iron grasp what gentlest touch may take what need with aspect dark to scare so awfully so terribly the weary soul would hardly care called quietly called tenderly from thy dread power to break tis not as when thou markest out the young the blessed the gay the loved the loving they who dream so happily so hopefully then harsh thy kindest call may seem and shrinkingly reluctantly the summoned may obey but i have drunk enough of life the cup assigned to me dashed with a little sweet at best so scantily so scantily to know full well that all the rest more bitterly more bitterly drugged to the last will be and i may live to pain some heart that kindly cares for me to pain but not to bless o oh, death come quietly come lovingly and shut mine eyes and steal my breath then willingly o oh, willingly with thee i'll go away and a poem this recording is in the public domain a tragedy by theophilus marziels read for LibriVox.org by chuck williamson death plop the barges down in the river flop flop plop above beneath from the slimy branches the gray drips drop as they scraggle black on the thin gray sky where the black cloud rack hackles drizzle and fly to the oozy waters that lounge and flop on the black scrag piles where the loose cords plop as the raw wind whines in the thin tree top plop plop and scudding by the boatmen call out hoy and hey all is running water and sky and my head shrieks stop and my heart shrieks die my thought is running out of my head my love is running out of my heart my soul runs after and leaves me as dead for my life runs after to catch them and fled they all are every one and i stand and start at the water that oozes up plop and plop on the barges that flop and dizzy me dead i might reel and drop plop dead and the shrill wind whines in the thin tree top flop plop a curse on him Ugh. yet i knew i knew if a woman is false can a friend be true it was only a lie from beginning to end my devil my friend i had trusted the whole of my living to ah oh, and i knew ah oh, 
so what do i care and my head is empty as air i can do i can dare plop plop the barges flop drip drop i can dare i can dare and let myself all run away with my head and stop drop dead plop flop plop end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Truthful Song by Rudyard Kipling Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf The Bricklayer I tell this tale, which is strictly true, just by way of convincing you how very little, since things were made, things have altered in the building trade. A year ago, come the middle of March, we was building flats near the marble arch when a thin young man with coal black hair came up to watch us working there now there wasn't a trick in brick or stone which this young man hadn't seen or known nor there wasn't a tool from trowel to maul but this young man could use em all then up and spoke the plumbers bold which was laying the pipes for the hot and cold since you with us have made so free will you kindly say what your name might be the young man kindly answered them it might be lot or methuselah or it might be Moses, a man I hate, whereas it is Pharaoh surnamed the Great. Your glazing is new, and your plumbing strange, but otherwise I perceive no change, and in less than a month, if you do as I bid, I'll learn you to build me a pyramid. The Sailor I tell this tale, which is stricter true, just by way of convincing you how very little, since things were made, things have altered in the shipwright's trade in blackwall basin yesterday a china bark refitting lay when a fat old man with snow-white hair came up to watch us working there now there wasn't a knot which the riggers knew but the old man made it and better too nor there wasn't a sheet or a lift or a brace but the old man knew its lead in place then up and spoke the cocker's bold which was packing the pump in the afterhold since you with us have made so free will you kindly tell what your name might be the old man kindly answered them it might be japheth it might be shem or it might be ham though his skin was dark whereas it is noah commanding the ark your wheel is new and your pumps are strange but otherwise i perceive no change and in less than a week if she did not ground i'd sail this hooker the wide world round both we tell these tales which are strictest true just by way of convincing you how very little since things were made anything alters in any one's trade end of poem this recording is in the public domain the viking code by isaiah stegner translated from swedish by thomas and martha holcomb Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Viking Code. Now he floated around on the desolate sea, like a prey seeking falcon he rode. To the champions on board he gave justice and law. Wilt thou hear now the Sea Viking's Code? Make no tent on thy ship, never sleep in a house, for a foe within doors you may view. On his shield sleeps the Viking, his sword in his hand and his tent is the heavenly blue see how short is the shaft of the hammer of thor but an ell's length the sword blade of frey tis enough for your weapon will never be too short if ye dare near the enemy stay when the storm rages fierce hoist the sail to the top oh how merry the storm king appears let her drive let her drive better founder than strike for who strikes is a slave to his fears never take on thy vessel the land sheltered maid where she freya herself she did snare for the dimples she wears are but pitfalls for men and a net is her free-flowing hair wine is all father's drink and the cup is allowed if you only can use it with sense 
he who falls on the land may arise who falls here he too ran the sleep giving goes hence if a merchant sail by you must shelter his ship but the weak will not tribute withhold you are king of the waves he a slave to his gains and your steel is as good as his gold let your goods be divided by lot or by dice how it falls you may never complain but the sea king himself takes no part in the lots he considers the honor his gain if a viking ship come there is grappling and strife and the fight neath the shields will rejoice if you yield but a pace you are parted from us tis the law you may act by your choice if you win be content he who praying for peace yields his sword is no longer a foe prayers a valhalla child hear the suppliant's voice he is a coward who answereth no wounds are vikings reward and the pride of the man on whose breast or whose forehead they stand let them bleed on unbound till the close of the day if you wish to be one of our band thus his law was enrolled and his name every day through all foreign coasts grew renowned for his like was not seen on the blue rolling sea nor the valor his champions crowned then he sat by the rudder and sullenly gazed in the depth of the blue rocking tide thou art deep in thy depth thriveth peace it may be but it thriveth not here where we ride is the white god enraged let him take up his sword i will fall if it thus is designed but he sits in the skies and the thoughts he sends down which forever are clouding my mind when the conflict came on then his spirit arose like an eagle refreshed for its flight and his brow it was clear and his voice it rang high like the thunderer first in the fight so from conquest to conquest unbroken he went and was safe over the high foaming grave and he saw in the south many islands and rocks till he came to the calm grecian wave when he saw the green groves that stand out from the waves and the temple before him uprose what he thought freya knows and the poet knows too and the lover he knows ah he knows here we ought to have dwelt here's the island and grove here the fane as my father set forth it was here it was here i invited my love but the cruel one stayed in the north surely peace has its home in those blissful green dales in the colonnades memory's words like the whisper of love are the murmuring founts and the bright song the voice of the birds where is ingeborg now hath forgotten me quite for the gray-haired and withered old king i can never forget but my life i would give if one sight of my love it would bring now three years have passed by since the land i beheld where heroic achievement prevails tower the honored mounds yet to the heavenly blue is it green in my forefathers dales on the grave where my father is laid i once planted a tree can it be it lives now and who cares for the weakling thou earth give it moisture and dew kindly heaven give thou but why linger i longer on far distant waves taking tribute and striking man down for my soul but despises the glittering gold and i've gained quite enough of renown there's a flag on the mast and it points to the north in the north is the land i hold dear i will follow the course of the heavenly winds and back to the northland i'll steer End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Voice of the Void by George Parsons Lathrop Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King I warn, like the one drop of rain on your face ere the storm, Or tremble in whispered refrain with your blood beating warm. I am the presence that ever baffles your touch's endeavour gone like the glimmer of dust dispersed by a gust i am the absence that taunts you the fancy that haunts you the ever unsatisfied guess that questioning emptiness wins a sigh for reply 
Nay, nothing am I but the flight of a breath, for I am death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When the Grass Shall Cover Me by Ina Corbrith Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King When the grass shall cover me, head to foot where I am lying, When not any wind that blows, summer blooms nor winter snows, Shall awake me to your sighing, Close above me as you pass, you will say, how kind she was, You will say, how true she was, when the grass grows over me. When the grass shall cover me, holding close to earth's warm bosom, While I laugh or weep or sing never more for anything, You will find in blade and blossom sweet small voices, Odorous, tender pleaders in my cause, that shall speak me as I was, When the grass grows over me. When the grass shall cover me, Ah, beloved, in my sorrow very patient, I can wait, knowing that, or soon or late, There will dawn a clearer morrow, When your heart will moan, Alas, now I know how true she was, Now I know how dear she was, When the grass grows over me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Where Go the Boats by Robert Louis Stevenson Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Dark brown is the river, golden is the sand. It flows along forever with trees on either hand. Green leaves are floating, castles of the foam, boats of mine are boating. Where will they all come home? On goes the river, and out past the mill, away down the valley, away down the hill, away down the river, a hundred miles or more. Other little children shall bring my boats ashore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.